Welcome, Benvingels, bienvenidos. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our director from the Ross uh, Center for Sustainable Cities, Ani Dasgupta, who is going to lead us today in this webinar. Very delighted to have you with us, Ani. Welcome. Thank you very much, Claudia, and a very, very warm welcome to all of you who have joined. It's so heartwarming to see people from all over the world part of this, um, and uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. Um, today is the third um, of the series on road safety. Today we are focusing on, um, on children and why um, safety for children is a critical part of it. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be part of it today. This is something I feel very strongly about. Um, my job is very straightforward. Uh, as Claudia uh, mentioned, I lead the city's work at WRI. My job is to introduce a topic and the absolutely fantastic panel we have. Wes, can you go to the next slide, please? The agenda for our uh, webinar today is pretty straightforward. Um, as you can see, uh, we have a panel of experts talking from their perspective the topic of our children and road safety. And we have Avi who will lead it. I'll introduce all the panel to you in a moment. Uh, we have a special address by Zuleka Mandela, who has been a real champion. Uh, I'll introduce Zuleka in a minute. And the whole idea is to have an exchange of learn from the expert, but have an exchange with all of you. Um, with that, Wes, um, uh, the next slide, please. First, let me, let me just um, warmly welcome all the participants of this program. I mean, it is today, uh, this cri the crisis we are in, both medical and employment um, lockdown. It's, a, it's our observation, it's centered around cities. Cities are suffering from many different ways, not only dealing with the crisis um, of, um, of the disease and the jobs, but also cities own income has gone down in most places. So I just want to say that in this middle of this crisis, all of you have, have prioritized safety and child safety and participating in this. I can't be more uh, inspired by your dedication on this. So thank you very much, all of you, all of you who are working in cities that have joined. A warm welcome. I hope this exchange enriches your uh, passion on the topic and make, helps us make a network and connection to this broader movement. Wes, next slide. This initiative is, is really a partnership, a collaboration of many organizations of different kinds. I'm not going to read through all the organization you can see, but I want to point out this includes uh, important financial organization, IDB, uh, the World Bank, uh, governments like U U um, United Kingdom, but also organizations like ours and UFIA foundations and Towards Zero Foundation that are trying to work and mobilize. So this is really a collaboration across uh, many, many different kinds of organizations. And we are very privileged uh, to be part of it in WRI. Wes? I really want to thank our three um, uh, partners and funders who are sponsors, who support us, 3M, PTB, and Volvo Group. I just want to point out they have been partners on this journey, not only for this initiative, but for many such initiative, and they're, they're very warmly a part of the bigger community. So thank you very much to all, um, all the three uh, sponsors um, that have supported this absolutely fantastic initiative. Wes? I want to spend a minute about talking about um, why in safety, child safety or safety of children is such a critical point important. The first part of this um, is pretty obvious, right? Um, it, children are uh, the most, best the next slide, please. Uh, the, one of the most vulnerable part of society, right? Uh, children needs our protection, our care, uh, also our, our most precious uh, part of our life and family. So simply, if you think about it, if, if children's, uh, children are safe, um, the, one of the most vulnerable part uh, in a city, then everyone else is safe. That's a pretty obvious thing that if we protect our most vulnerable, we make a city that is um, safe and usable for everyone. So that is obvious. That is a starting point. But I feel there's another part to it which is actually a complementary to that very obvious point of protecting our most vulnerable as a leading indicator, as Penalosa says here, uh, how children are indicator on the slide, is that children in cities 
is also a sign of the thriving, joyful cities. So let's just, this, let's do an experiment for 10 seconds, just 10 seconds. If you close your eyes, I can't see your eyes right now, but let's, let me assume you're closed. And if you imagine a city that you think you like, it could be your city, a city that you've seen in a movie, city that you want to travel to, or city you've been to. If you close your eyes for 10 seconds and think about that city, what image comes to your mind of a city that you like? My guess is the image in your head of a city that you like and you, you find city you want to be or want to be part of your own city has a lot of people in it. People walking around, sitting in cafes, doing, running to the park, and it has children in it. So the, the fact that if you can build cities that are successful actually has people safely, happily walking around and with their family and the children. So it is not, cities are not simply a place for us to live and work. Of course it is, but cities, successful cities, all the cities that you guys work on needs to be a place, we want it to be a place where we not only work and live, but we want to work and live. We want to raise our families. We want to be there. We, this is a place that we desire to be. And to that, to make that desire work, we have to create cities and spaces that people want to be and people have can feel safely to have their families and children run around. Last year, Wes, um, we ran a uh, competition. We ran a competition with cities all over the world focused on transformational change, uh, focused on how cities change. Um, and we, again, running it one this year. Last year, we had almost 200 applicants um, from all over the world all over the world, from Madrid's of the world to all the way um, to cities in China, cities in Latin America. The slide in front of you is a small NGO from, uh, from Tanzania, now all over Africa, um, called Sarsai, um, uh, that won the award. Uh, they won the award across many other competitors that were much bigger, had their much bigger project, because their, um, the jury, there was international jury, focused on this because they were very uh, innovative in using data and focus to make children walking to school safer, working with the school and communities. Why did they want the, of course, because of innovation, but the jury felt that if this simple, and also they use very little funds to do that, um, jury felt if we can start surgically working in cities with children bottom up, we will actually transform the city and make it better for them. So this is an example why focus on children's safety is not just the fact of children's safety, how that impacts the overall city and what kind of city does it produce. Our team, um, next, um, has been focusing on this. Claudia and her team has been focusing with the partners, thinking about, you know, what does, what are we learning from all these experiences across the world? What does make a uh, city safer for children? And they have concluded six things that makes our company like ingredients. They are different in different places. These are like, if, you, if you're cooking, these are the ingredients to make the recipe for a safer place for children in any city. Uh, of course, the actual recipe will be different in different places depending on it. But the, in this in, one is accessible green space, it's obvious. Safe walking and cycling infrastructure, low speed zones, car free streets, which has been very, very actually explore, expanding right now, safe school zone. This is where Sarsai example I just told you about and clean air zones where the air that kids and all of us breathe, especially kids are, are less polluted and safer cities of London are doing an amazing initiative on that. So our team's thinking that these are the core ingredients. We would love to hear from our expert and um, the panel and also all of you if, if this is what you feel saying and what are the other things you're thinking about. The COVID, the crisis we are in part of best next um, is very much has open windows. It is a crisis, no, but absolutely all of us are going through it. Now it's the month, seven months, I think we are at least for our team that we are working from home, but it has opened political windows across the world for real change. And I, I just want to point this out Across the world, people have taken this opportunity, politicians, city leaders, department heads, 
to actually rethink the cities and streets. And if that can be made more safer, make more walkable, more bikeable. And the most encouraging part is not only it's happening in large rich cities like London and Paris, but it's happening in Bogota, in cities in Brazil, in cities in India. And this, I'm sure it's happening in the cities all of you represent. And we would love to hear the initiatives that, the, that has been created and hopefully how we can actually per, make this permanent. I think there is a, this particular crisis has created an opportunity uh, for us to rethink how we can make dramatic progress uh, to make our cities and streets safer for everyone, especially for children. I want to leave you with this, with this article. It's actually from New York Times, Wes, next. Um, is that this is, um, this is struck because New York Times, United States is such a mainstream newspaper and this is a West Side, uh, East Side Highway um, which is a very, very busy highway that was created next to the water to move traffic up and down uh, from in the New York City. It's a, and New York Times argued that this is the moment for us to think about even these arterial highways, how we can think about different. And this is the moment for bold vision. And they, a co community organization there, Wes, can you go to the next slide, um, is actually rethinking in New York City how such arterial roads can be rethought and made different and safer for everyone and mostly non-motorized traffic. Um, I'm sharing this thought with you because this, as you hear about these experts, you'll see that how this topic is so central for a core of what a successful city should look like. This leads me to uh, introduce our fantastic panel of experts um, next. Um, before I do that, because we have a um, few people who have joined since I started speaking, I want to remind everyone next that please, all, we want this to be interactive session in this format that we have of a seminar, the way we interact is through the chat function. So please, I want to encourage all of you to use the chat function, the all panel, all and attendees function, ask your question, interact with the panel as we go on. Um, with that, I want to introduce our panelists um, next. Our moderator today, I'm so pleased and happy, is Avi Silverman, who is a partner, a friend, who has been working with us for many, many years. He's a deputy director of FIA Foundation. He was in UNICEF, um, a, a real leader in this in this field. Avi, um, do justice. I won't do justice to introducing you properly. Avi, please. Annie, thank you very much. And thank you to the whole WRI team. Uh, we're delighted to be involved today. Yeah, myself, uh, as Annie says, I'm Deputy Director of the FIA Foundation. Um, I'll keep it very brief, a little bit about me. Um, one of the things I've been very proud to work with the FIA Foundation for, for many years, actually now, and um, we do a lot of work globally, a lot of work also in the region in Latin America, linking the practical work on the ground that many of you are taking forward with, with the global advocacy to really shift the global agenda. Um, we're a foundation. Our mission often is to see other donors and other foundations come in and really bring um, solutions to scale, which is what we want to see uh, more than anything to make a real impact at the end of the day for children in particular, as Annie uh, outlined. And we have a real um, a priority and emphasis on children. I've been delighted to uh, take forward some, um, some real breakthroughs as far as we're concerned road safety and the sustainable development goals and um, really engaging with the likes of, uh, of UNICEF and other key global institutions to get them uh, on board on, on this very important agenda that Annie uh, outlined. So thank you and I'm, I'm just delighted to be involved. Thank you, Avi, thank you very much. Our, our next panelist is Natalie. Uh, Natalie Drazen, someone we are we're working closely with. Natalie, warm welcome. Natalie is the director of North American Office and the UN representative of FIA Foundation. Natalie. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Ani, for that, that introduction. And Avi, for telling everyone what the foundation does, because now I don't have to do it. And Avi is very modest about the immense role that he's played. Um, so thank you, Avi, for that as well. Um, a bit about me, uh, I lead the foundation's activities across the Americas and I help um, advance evidence-based solutions around the world. 
Uh, some of the, the things that I'm very proud of is helping establish uh, Vision Zero for Youth here in the US with National Center for Safe Routes to School, um, which took off and is being done now in Mexico City, thanks to ITDP, as well as Bogota and India, thanks to WRI. So this is really a, a global uh, thing that, that I hope many of you will consider in your own cities. Um, another recent development is the tra um, traffic conflict analysis toolkit that we did with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And the idea here is that we actually don't have to wait uh, for injuries and deaths to occur. We can assess behavior and address um, risky behavior before, the, before those tragedies occur. So another thing to check out. Um, and then you'll hear about this later, but with NACDO, I helped uh, think up the uh, Streets for Kids guide, which I'm also very proud of and I hope will be a good resource for many of you. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing in your cities and for being flexible during this pandemic and adapting. Uh, and thank you to WRI for having me. Thank you, Natalie. I really want to thank you for our long partnership and uh, collaboration with you. It has been an absolute pleasure. Um, our next panelist is Lars Ekman. Uh, we are so pleased, Lars, you have joined us. All of us know Sweden is like a path breaker in this topic, as shown us the way. Um, He's a road safety expert from um, Swedish uh, Transport Authority. Lars, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be to be among you, and it's rather fascinating to meet so many countries in in such a short uh, moment. Uh, my name is Lars Ekman. I work at the Swedish Transport Administration. Implement trying to implement the the, the Vision Zero, uh, very practical on on streets and roads in in Sweden. Also work quite a lot uh, within the Vision Zero Academy, where we support actually the rest of the world will with the intellectual uh, framework for, for, for good traffic safety work uh, with the Vision Zero. Uh, and I don't need to explain that for you. Uh, I have a, talking about academy, I have my background as a researcher at Lund University. I did my PhD some 25, 60 years ago on, on Valdemar Road use. So, um, um, so, so I, I, I think it's, it's very interesting to have evidence-based and it's on, on, on research and, and knowledge. It, it's not only um, an, an, a fluffy or, or a nice idea, it's actually about uh, uh, true facts that we actually can and will work towards zero fatalities and, and, and seriously injured. Thank you very much, Lars. And I love your emphasis on evidence and helping evidence shape our thinking on this. This is something we are very focused on. Thank you very much for joining. Our next panelist is Annie. Annie Payton, uh, can you turn the camera on? There she is. Um, hi, Annie. Uh, Annie uh, is a senior program associate in NACTO. Um, we work very closely with NACTO. NACTO is doing fantastic stuff in this area. Annie, over to you. Hi there. Hi, I'm Annie Payton. And as um, Annie said, we, I work with NACTO Global Designing Cities Initiative, which is a nonprofit based in New York City that works to make uh, city is better for people by focusing on the design of urban streets. Um, and I work with our Streets for Kids program, which looks at streets specifically through the lens of kids and their caregivers. Um, we recently launched a new design guide that Natalie will speak more about called Designing Streets for Kids, um, where we highlight design strategies and programs and policies that are really great for kids and for other street users. Um, and we advocate um, integrating play and joy and beauty into redesigning streets for safety um, and I really love working in the intersection of play and of safety um, because we really, I and everyone else that I work with really believe that what's great for kids is great for all people. So thanks so much. Thank you, Annie. Thank you for joining. Annie, I hope when you speak in the panel, you do focus on joy that you talked about. I think that is a very critical in ingredient for success here. Thank you for joining us. Our final panelist is, um, there she is is uh, Maria Fernanda Rodriguez Bongol, but famously known as Nani to all of us. Uh, uh, she's a founder and president of Fundas and Gonzalo Rodriguez. Nani, please. Uh, thank you, Ani. Hola uh, a toda Latinoamérica. Uh, I will speak, of course, in, in English. We have great translation. Um, I'm uh, the president of an NGO, Fundacion Gonzalo Rodriguez. I've been working improving children's life um, from 20 years, more or less. And, um, and the last 13 years, we focused just on child road safety. 
we became partners of FI Foundation. So our goal is to bring to Latin America uh, tools, training, um, uh, technical people, experts, uh, everything that we see in other regions, in other countries, bring it to, uh, to our countries as cities. We work with governments in many countries of Latin America. And I'm very happy to share uh, our experience in some of the countries in, in Latin America and show um, why it's so uh, interesting, strategic and smart to start working from children to make a big change in road safety in general. Thank you. Thank you, Nani. And Nani's organization and Nani is doing absolutely fabulous work. And it's a privilege for all of us to um, collaborate with you, Nani. Thank you for being here. Um, as I, as I uh, give uh, the floor to, um, uh, to Avi, I have a singular pleasure um, to, uh, we have a Zuleika. I don't know, I was seeing the chat thing going on. I don't know if Zuleika is actually connected right now, but uh, we will go with the video, Avi. But Zuleika is, uh, um, has a message for all of us. As, as you all know, Zuleika is a absolute advocate uh, for child safety. She's a child health initiative global ambassador. It was a real privilege uh, we organized for us to have Zuleika here last year during our uh, annual TT meeting and she inspired all of us. Um, I had a privilege to meet with her. Uh, but I want to hand over to you, Avi, to introduce Zuleika properly and introduce the video. Thank you, Avi, over to you. Thank you, Annie. And yes, I do believe Zuleika is actually on the call as oh, well okay. at the moment. So hope that doesn't cause any confusion, but her, her video uh, that she very kindly did for this session uh, will be, I know, playing shortly. Um, and she'll be able to listen to herself, which I'm sure will be a slightly strange experience. But anyway, um, yeah, just to say Zoleka has been a, a tremendous uh, campaigner and um, ambassador um, for, for road safety globally. I'm sure you all know some of you the story and I won't um, speak at length, but she, she very sadly lost her daughter, uh, Zanani uh, Mandela, um, when actually she was only really just 13 years old, um, killed um, in road traffic um, injury on Johannesburg Road and um, a very sad uh, story. But what has been incredible has, is how Zoleka has turned this tragedy into such positive uh, campaigning. And I know that it's very painful and difficult to do that, but um, she's managed to somehow. I still to this day don't quite know how she does it. But she, she's been campaigning globally, worldwide. Um, she's been really pushing uh, at all levels, um, from presidents and heads of agencies through to city leaders and, uh, and communities as well, um, all around the world and in her home country in South Africa, um, to make cities and make the streets safer for uh, children and young people everywhere. And, uh, and she's had some tremendous results in her campaigning globally. Uh, with us. We're deeply honoured to be able to, um, to work with her and for her to continue the legacy of, of her grandparents, of, uh, of Nelson and Winnie Mandela, and to, um, to, to really campaign in their spirit um, for change to address the, the challenges that we face um, today. But I'll, I'll stop now and um, I'm sure we'll go over to her video soon. Thank you. Thanks so much to WRI for inviting me to contribute to this brilliant webinar. I'm also hugely honored to have been invited by WRI to be a juror on the Vision Zero Challenge Awards. Often in our campaigning, we can be critical of our city and government leaders for failing to act. While it's essential that we keep up the pressure, we must also really shine a light on the progress that's being made. And we must incentivize and celebrate the progress and good practice. This is why the Vision Zero Challenge is so important. I want to, sp to speak on behalf of families all over the world. As a mother, I can tell you how vital it is to keep our children safe. My child was killed on a Johannesburg road. Around the world, thousands of children are killed and injured every day. I don't want any family to suffer as mine has done. And you know what? They don't need to suffer. We absolutely can save lives. Vision Zero is an approach that we know works. 
It's about understanding that road traffic fatalities are both unacceptable and preventable. There will always be human error, but we need to ensure that people are not punished with death sentences. Our roads can and must be made safe. And we have the solutions. The cities taking part in the Vision Zero Challenge are leading the way. There's been such great work in Latin America, and your continuing work to save lives can be a real motivator to countries like mine and others all around the world. In the Child Health Initiative, we've been working with Latin America and indeed worldwide to save lives. We've been supporting solutions like those I saw earlier this year in Ghana. I saw firsthand how our incredible partner, the MN NGO, has put in life-saving infrastructure on the school journey. It can be as simple as a safe crossing or a safe sidewalk. One lesson I learned was that lowering speed is an absolute priority. It is non-negotiable. We need to see this everywhere. We know it can be done, and we're really excited to be working with WRI and all our partners to build more and more momentum. Let's keep up the good work, and let's make Vision Zero a reality everywhere. Thanks. Thank you to Zoleka for that uh, video. Um, a very powerful statement indeed, and really encapsulating the, the purpose and the objective behind uh, the Vision Zero uh, challenge. Um, I uh, now have the pleasure to uh, hand over to Natalie Drazen, who was introduced before, my colleague at the FIA Foundation, um, who's been doing some really important work I wanted to emphasize um, with um, global guidance on reopening schools for, for COVID that she's going to uh, tell you about. This is absolutely critical uh, guidance, particularly for the situation we're in at the moment, um, showing really what the opportunities are for our agenda uh, in, in the current situation that we all face. But without hesitation, I hand over to Natalie. Thank you so much, Avi. Uh, let's see, I'm going to share my PowerPoint. Um, just to give you all a bit of, of background, um, we host the Child Health Initiative at the FIA Foundation. And that's something that WRI and Fundacion Gonzalo Rodriguez and NACTO are also part of. So we're so glad uh, to have, to be part of this today and, and to have you all on this call as well. Um, I'm going to tell you briefly about our latest approach to applying the safe systems approach. And basically what we're talking about here is an often overlooked gap when we think about reopening schools. It's not keeping kids safe at school, it's actually on the journey to school itself. So to address that, we've created uh, guidance with UNICEF um, and it has 10 key actions at its heart. And really the foundation of all of this is the safe systems approach. Um, because what we're building on here is this, this opportunity, kind of the silver lining of the pandemic to accelerate um, a lot of the walking and cycling initiatives that you're all doing at, at your city level. And the measures that are going to essentially have double benefits um, prevent COVID-19 and also prevent road traffic injuries, which we know are killing our children. So before I go into the guidance, I just want to say I'm sure that many of you on this call, especially those of you where your schools have reopened, have examples of how to keep our kids safe on the journey to school. And I ask you to please, please share those. So we've um, created a database online where you can actually submit your examples. It's pretty easy to submit, as you can see here. And if it's not easy, I hope you'll please tell me so that I can make it easy, because uh, this is all adaptable. And here's the website. So please uh, share this database, check it out, um, contribute to it. Now, I'm going to quickly go through a couple of areas of this guidance that I think will be of interest to you. Um, as you're thinking about keeping kids safe as they go back to school. Now, the first one is non-motorized transport because we all know that walking and cycling is very conducive to physical distancing. 
Check out this example from NACTO in Bogota. Uh, it's pre-pandemic, but look at all the space that you have there for kids and their caregivers to spread out because the road in front of the school is closed and has these great painted features as well, um, and with some greenery too. Um, notice how this also can help slow down traffic around the school. And this is something that um, you'll see featured in the Designing Streets for Kids guide, which Annie talked about earlier. And um, I hope you'll please ask Annie some questions about this uh, during the chat. It's a great resource. Um, you can find it at NACTO's website and the Child Health Initiative as well. Now, another way of, of just closing down streets is, uh, for example, through London School Streets Initiative. Um, they close down the whole street or just part of a, a lane of traffic if um, it's busy. And sometimes just for the beginning or the end of the day, it doesn't have to be the whole day. This is what success looks like because we know that we always have to measure success. Uh, so something good to note there and compare across cities. Now, of course, we can't expect kids to walk and cycle if it's not safe. So a lot of cities are taking uh, the opportunity right now to decrease speeds to 30 kilometers an hour, which is a best practice by the WHO. I love what they're doing in Vietnam. Uh, they have a special back to school uh, speed reduction initiative where they are kindly reminding people of the speed limit for the first two weeks and then actually issuing fines uh, thereafter. Obviously one of the best ways, as you know, to decrease speeds is through infrastructure that forces people to slow down. And IRAP has an excellent uh, Star Ratings for Schools app that you can download and use uh, to do exactly this. Um, and another way to separate kids from traffic is through pre-designated walking and cycling school buses where an adult helps kids walk and cycle to school. This is an image from China, but this is happening all over the world. Uh, Bogota before the pandemic had its Al Colegio and BC program, uh, which WRI can tell you more about too. And they've adapted this now to the pandemic so that kids can cycle safely outside of their homes. The India Cycles for Change Challenge from WRI, um, sorry, from ITDP, recognizes that we have to increase our infrastructure for cycling as well and um, suggests these initiatives for cities. But really what they get at here is that all these temporary changes have to become permanent. And that's something that we all need to strive for together. Um, all of our partners will tell you that you can't possibly uh, undervalue the, um, the importance of uh, engaging children and using paint. So in Vision Zero for Youth in Mexico City, um, they got kids outside and asked them what changes they wanted to see. And then together with the community, got out the uh, buckets of paint and helped paint uh, sidewalks and, and crosswalks and curb extensions. And this has more of just a road safety impact. You can imagine how empowered this girl felt when she pointed to the crosswalk behind her and she said, or sorry, the uh, zebra crossing and said, I did that. Um, that's a lifelong change there. So get the kids involved ask them what they'd like. Um, now, of course, it's a great time to help kids um, bike and walk safely and to help them follow protocols. Uh, here's a free bike school from Bogota, which I, I love. Um, it's a great time to teach kids how to bike safely. Uh, here's what Addis Ababa, Ethiopia is doing, converting empty parking lots to cycling training grounds so kids can, can learn to cycle and practice safely as well. Obviously, bikes have to be available in the first place, which is why the Cycles for Change Challenge um, encourages community-led bike rentals so that cycles, um, bicycles can be available to children. Now, one thing that we really need to focus on uh, in the safe systems approach is removing the vector itself, cars, and, and speed, of course. So reducing private vehicle use is really important. I just wanna to touch on this briefly um, because what we can't do right now is follow advice of mayors like New York City, uh, who says, you know, everybody should be driving their kids to school. Yes, I acknowledge that it might cost some children's lives. That's, it's not the time for that. Uh, that would result in Carmageddon, um, more pressure on an already strained health system. We have to reduce private vehicle use. And so one way to do that is through, um, through carpools, if you have to drive your kid to school, use a, a shared vehicle with other members of your bubble, right, to reduce exposure. That's really important. 
Another way is through uh, remote drop-off locations. So New Zealand calls these uh, kiss and go zones where you actually drop your kid off um, at you know, a public parking lot or a designated um, like church ground or something. And then the kid walks or cycles uh, the rest of the way to school. Um, this is also important to reduce air pollution, right? Because we know that air pollution is tied severity of COVID-19. So there's definitely a double benefit here. Now, obviously, reducing car usage also is about increasing public transportation and, and shared transportation. And in many countries, motorcycles are shared transportation. So one way to do that, you'll see what they did in Vietnam, they actually painted parking lines um, for motorcycles to park at a distance and also to keep them off the sidewalks because we can't have kids walking and cycling if there's motorcycles on the sidewalks. It's a great time for helmet laws. Um, again, removing the strain from the, uh, the health system and you can check out how Vietnam got their helmet law. This is a report that's on our website. Um, and it's also a time to think about the benefits of, of reducing harassment on public transportation. It turns out that physical distancing and trying to keep quiet to avoid the, to avoid the spread of COVID also reduces um, harassment. We have to ask populations that are gonna face challenges, how they feel about this, how they're doing, what do they need? Um, this is really an important time to be in touch with, um, with people on public transportation. And I know that there's hesitation around using public transportation, but we've seen that there actually haven't been any COVID outbreaks tied to public transportation. So that's really important to keep in mind too. Now, of course, we have to sustain uh, changes in the long term. I love what WRI Ethiopia is doing on this. They're revamping their non-motorized transport plan. It's a great time to do that. They're participating in weekly emergency calls, uh, making sure that high risk areas are prioritized. And they're recognizing that cities are facing budget deficits. We have to phase in uh, different approaches to increasing non-motorized transport. Most of all, they're collecting data. And that's what I would encourage all of you to do. Go collect the data on decreased uh, road traffic injuries and deaths, on decreased air pollution, so that we can make a case for many of these temporary changes becoming permanent. And check this out on our website uh, here. We have lots of low resource suggestions. Uh, this guidance is definitely focused on low resource suggestions. And again, we encourage you to please share your experiences so that we can all learn from each other. Thank you so much. Back to you, Abby. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, I know that we only have about 45 minutes left and we, we want to have as much of a discussion as possible. So very quickly, I'm going to be slightly unpopular and say that we have to, to obviously, um, Nani, I know will be very powerful and very uh, brief at the same time. Um, but Nani Rodriguez, um, president and founder of Fundacion Gonzalo Rodriguez and a, a leading light in uh, both Uruguay and across Latin America uh, on this agenda, I'll hand over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Avi. I will go very quick uh, so we can have questions from all the audience. Uh, next slide, please. Well, um, we work in many countries of Latin America, uh, so that gave us uh, the chance to see uh, that most of us in this region, we have the same problems and we are in similar uh, stage of road uh, safety for, for children. Next one, please. Um, this is how we start. We start in 2007. Uh, we partnered with FIA Foundation. At that point, no one, non any country in Latin America, they had in the legislations, and they never, they, they, Novo, Novo Mas, uh, they talk about child safety in, this, in terms of road safety. So we decide to uh, start from one small country, which is Uruguay, three million people. And we, we study the strategy, we develop a, a program based on, the, on different cases in Europe. And when we put it on place, we, we learned the lesson that we have to change it uh, very, very strong because uh, uh, it didn't work in the beginning. We designed a very nice uh, campaign for, uh, for um, vehicle safety for uh, to, to promote the child seats in vehicles. And when we really went deep into the 
um, pediatricians, schools, community to know what they think about it or what they know about it, about it. We realize that if we launch a campaign and we don't have a line like all these sectors, like uh, pediatricians, like the schools, like the government, the legislation in place, um, everything, the campaign won't work because you can put a very strong message, but if the pediatricians, for example, they are not aligned in, in this strategy, you will lose the battle. So one of the things we, we learn is, first of all, start from the easiest place, which is vehicles, and we will see this in the next chapter. Next one, please. Thank you. So what we did at, the, at that time is we stopped the public campaign. We didn't launch the campaign and we went like three steps uh, back and we start to do research to understand uh, what people know about child safety. Then we start to do training and then we start to do advocacy, especially with all the uh, politicians. And we start to put this in the public agenda and we start to do training on the consequences, on the strategies, on why we have to do this change, on the type of injuries that the children have if they don't travel in the way that we suggested, which is in, in car seats. And, and then after all that, which took us at least one year, we launched the campaign. So next slide. Of course, that to do something like this, we need to partner with really important, strong, big organizations, which is, you can see the logos here, because we need to have not just funding, we need to have technical resources, we need to have institutional background, because to make a cultural change, the politicians need to have the support from the population. So to do that, we really need to articulate with different uh, international, regional, and local bodies. Next one, please. One of the most important things that I learned in all this process is to work together with media. We need to train media uh, and the journalists, especially the journalists, to uh, in what in what we want to promote. If it's speed reduction, if it's school buses inside the vehicles, whatever we're going to to work, we need to work with media because they will put this in the public agenda, and the authorities will have the the support or yes they, they will have the support from the from the population because the people will start to talk about all this and 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 all the things will move together so um, it's very very important to try to keep the message on the public agenda uh, during all the year all the time talking about these topics because we are fighting against other diseases uh, economical problems. Well, now, of course, we have COVID. Uh, so we, we really need to have road safety, child road safety on the top of the discussions. And, and when we talk about children, it's, it's something that it's, people can, can't resist. And, and everyone agree to work or to be worried or to communicate things that will make the life uh, healthier or easier to a, to a child. So next one, please. When we start, we choose the vehicle because starting from vehicle safety is the easiest one. Of course, uh, we have other type of, um, of areas to work like, which is the, chi the child as a pedestrian, as a cyclist, as a passenger of motorcycle, which is that one of the biggest, biggest problem that most of us, our cities we are facing now. Um, and we have the kids inside vehicles. So approaching the topic from here, it gave us the opportunity to explain things like forces, uh, things about um, different safety um, devices like car seats, helmets, seat belts. We can talk about um, responsibility. We can talk about many, many things. And, and this was, gave us the chance to start to train and the population. And then when we work through kids, then it will be more easy to work in other aspects like alcohol, seat belts for adults, and other aspects which you, we all know that road safety is a, is a big, big topic. Next one, please. 
Then uh, I want to make a, a special mention here. When we work uh, in a topic, we can, we can do it like in a soft way, soft, very soft way, or we can really think in going really deep. We see in many of our cities that, uh, for example, the legislation or regu regulations for school buses is to paint in yellow or a specific color the school bus to be seen in the outside, have the signs that says school buses, a special light, and that's it. But we don't really pay attention on the seats inside. As you can see here in the picture, the picture of those seats were like the old school buses in Uruguay. We, we changed this, we made a study with, the in, with engineers, we study how to put good seats that if we have a crash in, in the school buses, the kids won't get hurt. So if we going to talk about kids, we really, really want to do it seriously. Uh, because if we have a school bus, which looks very nice from outside, but inside is unsafe and we have a crash, and then we have like five, 10 kids that they died inside that school bus, all our strategy will collapse. So we really, really need to do things with responsibility, with a base on technical uh, regulation, and we really need to do things like seriously. So next one, please. One of the, uh, the things that we saw that it's strategic is to work together with the national road safety agencies. We have to go through uh, starting from the top, like Ministry of Transport, then the road safety national agencies, and then go to the cities. And we need to work in all the levels. Uh, that's the only way we can make a real impact in a long term. That's, that's the only way, working together, having a dialogue, social, uh, like the NGOs, private sector and governments all together. Next one, please. Another strategic thing that it will help us to all the stakeholders is to make public the agreements. This is in Colombia. Uh, we are signing uh, an agreement with the Ministry of Transport. The other guy, it was the director of the road safety agency. And we went, and this is a win-win for everyone. When we sign this agreement uh, publicly, this uh, they will have the government will have uh, the support. They will have like the excuse that they have to work on these issues, and 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 the population will walk through all this process because they see the, uh, a government that is responsible and is trying to take care of our our kids, our family. So I think these protocol things, uh, sometimes they look like bureaucracy, but I think it's, it's need, it's, it's a good uh, thing to put it and put it on the media, show to the people that they, from the ministry of the, or the president of the country, everyone is committed to save children's life in our cities. Next one, please. Here, I want to show some of the, uh, of, of other difference. For example, we have like in Argentina, in one of the cities in Mendoza, we 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 work through the we, we, we work through the mayor in uh, safer school zones, and in one year we can achieve we can have the impact in almost 3, 000, uh, 30 thousand kids, for example. We can see that in the left part of the of the slide, and then the other one, which is. 6,000 is child restraint system is what we do as an NGO in the checkpoints where the parents, they come to check the, the seats. But we did this uh, like in, 10, in seven, 10 years, more or less. So if we go directly as an NGO one-to-one, -one, it will take us a too, you know, too long uh, or too many years to, uh, to make like a big real impact. We, but in the other hand, I have to say that it's good to have, if you work uh, uh, as a, um, as a, in a city level, you make like policies or decisions or programs that go to all the city, but also it is good to have some small programs to be in contact with the community because that, it's, like a, it's, a, uh, it's like a window that you have with reality that you see the day by day and you can um, adjust your strategy because you are in contact with with the with the real people and on the ground. So, I think it's 
it's, it's very strategic to make a combination of both strategies. Uh, it's, it's very important to do research because that will give us like the excuse and the, the, the background and the support to go to media and say, okay, I'm doing this because I did this research, this is the result and we must to act because this, this and that. So public campaigns are needed, research is needed, some small programs to be in contact with a population and be on the ground is needed, but also strategies in a city level or national level or regional level, it's, uh, it's also needed. So it's a combination of everything and that's the balance that everyone has to, to, to make in their own cities. Next one, please. Well, this is just a reflection. I know that you will all agree, but every time we sit down to plan a strategy and to put the goals and to put the time frame when we are going to achieve these outcomes, the outcomes that we write down in a, in a strategic plan, uh, we have to think, we really have to think how much uh, we lose when we have a, a permanent uh, injury in a child, when we have, like when in a family we lose a child, when a child died, uh, that's an impact in every sense, uh, in the family, in the school of that kid. Um, also for, for us, you know, we need young people to grow up and healthily so they can be part of the economic and social uh, uh, life of the country, of the city. So we really need to think uh, this, and I'm sorry that I'm, I'm, I'm so key on this because 10 years ago, the word of child or children, Nino, in, uh, it didn't exist in any of the road traffic legislation reglementation. So we really need to put this on place and we really need to put kids on the front uh, on our legislation and, and, and reglementations. Next one, please. Well, thank you very much for any questions. I'm available. Thank you, Abby. Thank you very much, Nani. Uh, as usual, very, very informative uh, presentation. And obviously, uh, I would certainly always say if anyone wants to know how to get this change done um, in reality on the ground, uh, you, you speak to Nani. Nani will um, be able to take you through it. Um, and um, I want to move on to our discussion uh, now. And I'm sure we'll have more of a, a chance to really drill into um, a lot of these issues. Um, one thing first is that you'll see in the chat um, the uh, menti.com um, poll um, that's being put out. And um, Alejandro um, Schwedhelm of WRI is going to just explain a little bit further um, how to uh, engage. Thank you very much, Avi. Thank you, everyone, uh, Nani, Natalie, and Soleka for your great presentations, all the attendees for being here. Um, as I just mentioned in the chat, um, I'm going to share my screen and I see some already started answering the polls. So, as you can see here in the screen, um, please go with your cell phone or your browser in your computer uh, to www.menti.com and uh, use the code that is next to it, um, 27347511. So make sure the slide is active. And for the first question, you'll be able to answer um, as many options as you want. Uh, the question is what dedicated road safety planning for children exists in your city? Um, so you have all of these options, safe speeds around schools, um, directly around the schools, traffic calming in front of schools being the second option, special street designs or crossings in front of schools, low speed zones around school districts, so wider implementation, uh, walking, biking to school programs, road safety plan for children, 
education campaigns about road safety for children, none of the above. So we'll give you two minutes, two more minutes or so to answer your questions. We'll try to get as many answers as possible. Looks like we already have over 20 responses, that's great. Keep them coming a little longer and then I'll move over to the next poll question. I may just jump in and say, obviously, I know Alejandro is going to go to the next one. It's interesting to see what people are putting down um, with with key priorities. Um, safe speed limits, obviously, is a, is a major uh, priority, number one priority for um, a lot of people are putting down low speed zones around schools um, uh, on or another as well. And we'll try and build that into our discussion that we have um, in a couple of minutes time um, as well. Thank you, Abby. Looks like we already have about 26 responses. And we'll go ahead and move over to the next question. So, Question number two, and we're already getting some responses. That's great. What element of the safe mobility system for children would you most like to learn about? And here you can only answer up to three. You can only submit three uh, of your top questions. Uh, improving quality for walking, bike infrastructure around schools, number one. Number two, designing and implementing traffic calming uh, around schools, number three, let's speed limit around schools, number four, enforcing safe speeds around schools, number five, enforcing safe speeds around, hang on one second, sorry, looks like there's one repetition, we'll add those together. Next one, how to get children and families involved in road safety. Next, how to empower politicians to improve road safety for children. Next, how to prioritize children in road safety planning. So thank you. We're getting about 25 responses. We'll give you about a minute or two to submit as many answers as you can. I could start to move on to introducing our, our panelists for the discussion now, if that's um, if that's okay. Um, we have a really good panel um, just now, and I know we've not got much time, so I'll move on to it fairly fairly soon, and we'll build in um, the responses to the polling into our into our discussion. Um, you've heard from Natalie Drazen earlier uh, from the FIA Foundation um, doing that excellent work on. Uh, safe journeys to school in the COVID context she's been leading. Um, Lars Ekman um, from the Swedish uh, Transport Authority, the road safety uh, specialist from the Swedish Transport Authority and a, and a worldwide leader in Vision Zero and in the safe system um, who can, who I'm sure will be able to give his insights uh, really helpfully for us. Um, Nani Rodriguez, president founder of Fundacion Gonzalo Rodriguez, who you just heard, um, with a, a real leader in how to move things forward um, on this agenda at city and national level. Um, Annie Payton, uh, the senior program associate um, from NACTO um, as well on our panel. And NACTO have been doing some real uh, groundbreaking work 
uh, on uh, this agenda across uh, in Latin America, obviously, uh, as well. And we were delighted to be collaborating with NACTO on the uh, Streets for Kids uh, design guide, at WRI as well, uh, on, on that outputs like that, that NACTO have been taking forward. Um, so to move on to, to the discussion, and if our panelists can um, unmute and, um, and put their uh, put their videos on for everybody. Um, a first um, question that um, that we had coming through um, that I wanted to address um, really was along the lines of uh, I think it's Diego Fontana uh, in the in the chat was asking about documentation and a manual to help safe decisions to help make safe decisions regarding road safety for our children. And this was something also in the polling um, just now as well is really how can we move, you know, can, can we put, point to some specific um, uh, guidance um, that can help and how can we move forward our, our decision making and the ability of our cities to be able to um, respond um, to this agenda. And I think your insights on all of that would be very welcome. Um, I'll start off with um, Lars because um, Lars, I hasn't had a chance to speak yet, and I'll, I'll go to Annie next, and then our and then our other um, panelists. Well, um, uh, I wasn't really prepared for that uh, with a good handbook for for this this work. I, but but I'm, uh, but but I'm, I'm I'm so pleased to hear that you're actually using the Vision Zero as a, a good the good framework for 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 the work here and applied on, on children. And it's a, I think that Vision Zero and children is a, both interesting and sad in a way. It's interesting because uh, it's so easy to understand that the zero is the, the only decent goal. I mean, it's, it's very hard to, to say, hear someone say that there is a decent number of children getting killed uh, and so on. So, so it, it's very easy to, to put emphasis on, on children. On the other hand, it seems to be the case that the, the thing, the idea of Vision Zero is not only a fluffy, ambitious goal. It's actually a total shift in, in, in view on how we do things. We have to realize that people are vulnerable, sh children are ex extra vulnerable, and we have to understand that people make mistakes. But it's interesting that the society seems to have more acceptance for well-educated adults doing the mistakes not keeping to the speed limits rather than uh, for children and children should be trained and but when it comes to to road safety for adults we put lots and lots of money to build safe roads and so on so i, I think it's it's utterly important that we have taught start to 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 do a change there that we really could put some big emphasis on it but then what we should do is what we have addressed already here. I mean, speed is of course extremely important and in urban areas, not only around schools, but in urban areas, 30 kilometers per hour is the only speed that we actually survive with people who make mistakes and even with children and so on. So speed is utterly important. And on those cases where you cannot have low speed, arterial roads, uh, rural roads and so on, you need to have a proper separation. And then I also heard from, from Nanny here the, the work with the protections in, in, in vehicles, because I think that's, that's, that's something really useful. And I use that as a success example, because in Sweden, that is one of the areas where we actually have reached zero. We virtually have no children sitting in vehicles, sitting in, in private cars getting killed because we have a very strong use of good child protection. So it's actually possible to protect the most vulnerable road user in vehicles if we do it properly. But when it comes to, to, uh, to uh, being in the streets, we still have too much emphasis on, on, on vehicles going, going fast in, in a town. So I think it's, it's utterly important that we, we could use this as an, uh, and COVID as, as many have mentioned, is a, has a momentum to do things that we thought was impossible before. 
Thank you, Lars. I'll move swiftly on to Annie. Uh, I'd love to hear Annie's, Annie's reflections on this. And I know there's such great um, outputs, guidance, um, documentation as well that, that NACTO have been taking forward. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, as Nanny was speaking, she said a specific phrase that really struck with me, which was talking about children is something that people can't resist. And that's something that we uh, at NACTO, as we were developing our Designing Streets for Kids guide, we thought a lot about that it's very hard to say no to children, right? And it's very hard for politicians to say no. It's very hard for public figures. It's obviously, it's a great cause that everybody worldwide really cares about. And so the idea of designing streets for kids and of focusing on children and urban streets, um, it's partially about the children and partially a way of making better streets for all people. Um, so it's this sort of this twofold approach for, you know, focusing on children, making really beautiful, wonderful, educational spaces for kids while simultaneously, you know, kind of having this secret agenda of making streets that work for everybody, um, for all people, for older people, for younger people, for, you know, you know, for people of all ages and all abilities and all, um, all, all levels in society. Um, so the idea of, uh, yeah, of basically what, what's good for children is good for all people. Um, and then the idea of streets offering this wonderful opportunity for children outside of school hours, right? Like we now schools are using outdoor spaces more than ever for, you know, outdoor learning, for social distancing. And um, like, so already we were starting to think about how streets can benefit children um, during other hours of the day that they're not in school, you know, how we can make educational murals and fun games that encourage uh, learning through play. Um, and so now, as Lars mentioned, COVID um, is a way of accelerating this momentum um, and ways of getting these types of projects, you know, literally on the ground even more quickly and in many more spaces, in many more schools, in many more streets around schools, um, and positively affecting many more children in a much quicker time frame than I think we were able to before. So I think there's lots and lots of interesting projects happening right now and pre-COVID that can be used um, to inspire and hopefully further this momentum even more. Thank you, Annie. Um, I wanted to jump to a question very quickly, uh, specifically on SARSI. That's a really important question. I'm going to come to Nanny in a minute, but I wanted to answer this question. And also in a minute, Natalie will be able to give you a bit more. But we have some very good guidance that includes the SARSI amend methodology that, that Annie Dasgupta um, spoke about at the beginning of the whole session, uh, where they've done very low cost um, speed um, interventions around schools, uh, infrastructure interventions, and it's on the Child Health uh, Initiative, childhealthinitiative.org uh, website on our toolkit. Um, we go into details about how to implement the, um, the SARSI uh, methodology and interventions. And it's also, it, we have a, a, a really good report that Natalie actually led as well on um, called um, uh, Streets for Life, uh, Calle para la Vida, uh, which uh, is also on the Child Health Initiative uh, website as well, but to, and has a lot of the work that Nanny has been doing. But to go to Nanny very quickly um, on, this, um, on this question, and also some questions that were being raised in the polling really you you addressed it a bit in your presentation but maybe to go into a bit more detail on on moving politicians as well you know um getting um getting cities to be able to implement and prioritize children and also getting politicians um you know mobilized and be able to change what they're doing i know you've, you've been so good at yeah um i want to just to show two examples that one it works and the other one didn't work the one that didn't work as I liked, it actually was in my own country, in Uruguay. We, we have the reglementation, we have, like, we trained the police, we did everything uh, about the child's uh, seats law campaign. But then uh, they, the police didn't enforce the law because they didn't have from the um, top of the governmental body, like the like the order or the decision to enforce the law, it took us more than three years to do that to achieve that. So, if you don't enforce the law, the statistic won't change. You will still have children dying inside vehicles. And in Chile, for example, we have the commitment with the Ministry of Transport. He made the commitment on TV. I was next to him, so I was quite impressed just looking to him like that. But he committed himself publicly 
then we train the police. We have the legislation in, in, in place and they really enforce the law. And in one year, that was in 2017, they went down the death of children inside vehicles in a 57%, 57. So it's very, very important to enforce the law. And then another recommendation that I would like to say in terms of um, one of the cheapest, and NACTO will be very happy with, with this comment, I'm sure. One of the cheapest measure and with the biggest impact is to reduce speed. That's very, very cheap to do it. So of course, in our cities, people will be against on, on that. I, I see it in many cities that people say, you are crazy. We are not going to drive 30 kilometers per hour. That's insane, it's too slow. So we are not facing that. So starting from schools, people won't get too aggressive because it's as as we said we're talking about children so that's very strategic but we need to check for example with the developing banks and all the financial bodies all the infrastructure projects they are on process or they're going to start in our cities and it's very very easy and it's like 0, 0.00 something of the investment to make a few changes on that uh, infrastructure project project to reduce the speed on the zones where are schools, theaters, universities, uh, hospitals, for example, uh, you know, those things. So my recommendation is uh, check that and, and see if you can make small changes because actually all the developing banks, they just agree to make changes without any, um, any reaction or uh, they, will, they are open to, to make those changes. So take the advantage of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nani. Uh, to move to Natalie, I'm sure she has lots to say on this uh, as well. We're going to try to extend just beyond uh, half past the hour. Uh, I don't want to keep you, but at the same time, we want to make sure we have enough time for discussion. Um, Natalie, um, the guidance and also this, this very, everybody is very um, interested in, in speed um, management as well. I know it's a big thing um, for us with our speed vaccine in, in the manifesto that we have, I'm sure we'll be able to tell people about. Sure, thanks so much, Avi. Uh, you'll see that I've already posted the link in the chat to the Child Health Initiative Toolkit and um, also the WHO's uh, Save Lives Technical Package, which has a section on speed management. And especially the Child Health Initiative Toolkit has a lot of low resources solutions uh, to speed management. So I wanna to talk to, about, to uh, the importance of using kids' voices, um, and then I'll get into the manifesto as well. Now, you know, before we were chatting about um, how do we involve children, children are irresistible, uh, how can they be agents of change? And when I say use kids' voices, I don't really mean use, I actually mean organically and genuinely engage. Um, because kids do want change and they know what kind of cities that they wanna see. So a great example of this in Latin America, uh, again, is Vision Zero for Youth in Mexico City. Uh, they taught kids basic road safety elements and then said, okay, now you know the details, what do you wanna see? Right? And kids know, they'll tell you, but even the youngest kids could go out. Um, in Mexico City, they had magnifying glasses. Uh, one side was red and one side was green, and they could take pictures of what they liked and what they didn't like about their infrastructure. Um, they did, WRI did something very similar in India using photo frames, red side, green side, just show us what you like and what you don't like. Um, present that to policymakers. Um, those are the voices that are irresistible and that have to be listened to. Now, we at the foundation um, believe strongly in this and we believe that adolescents in particular are not being heard and don't have the right amount of political will and funding going towards them. Uh, we see this in the statistics, they're being disproportionately affected by road traffic injuries and deaths. So that's why we've created the manifesto um, please check it out. It's at adolescence2030.org. I'll post that in a link too. Um, the short of it is that we are trying to aim for a global summit on adolescence uh, at the UN so that we can direct the appropriate level of political will and funding to this population that is so often left behind. Uh, so I'll post that again. Please check it out. Thanks. 
Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, to go on to another question that's coming up that we, I wanna make sure our panel uh, can address if possible is, um, how would you improve safety conditions in school zones that adjoin industrial zones where there is a high flow of trucks? Um, can anybody address this quickly? I know we, we've not got a lot of time in the session. Are there any takers from the panel? Nanny, I see Nanny. Okay, yeah, uh, there is many options. Uh, you have to study like the, Annie, you will like, uh, I think you have experience on this. You have to study where all the trucks will, um, they cross the, 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 the traffic. Maybe you can send the kids in another parallel uh, street or you can move the trucks or you can um, make, for example, slow the, the speed in certain moments of the day or you can put like uh, in that zone, you can use painting objects, you can paint the columns, street, uh, the trees, things like that. So you can make more visible that that's a children's zone because there is a, um, it's something that when you see like a lot of color and things like that, that it's identified with children in your mind, if you're a driver in your mind, you just, you slow down because you, it's like an alert thing that pop up in your mind. In your brain so um it's something that uh, everyone has to agree like uh, it's good to talk with the companies that they they have the trucks going back and forth or the industries on the zones you really have to put everyone on the same page and the, again you have to use the kids uh, healthy or the kids um, uh, name or, or phrase in the, in the beginning because no one will resist no one will say i want slow the, the the speed of my trucks in the school zone <laughs> no one will say that so use that take advantage of that and and you can make the changes thank you nanny we have just less than five minutes before i've got to go to claudia to wrap up the session we can't go much over the hour uh, due to translation other issues but lars i believe wanted to come in on this point as well yeah i just want want to to add add on that that is it's actually of course, you cannot compromise with safety just because it's trucks. And I think also it's the myth that trucks need high maximum speed because what is delayed for trucks is not uh, uh, dependent on, on, the, on the maximum speed. It's congestion and lots of other things. I mean, look at your average speed in a vehicle. So, so that is really not a problem. And I think that that is, if you do use facts, you will see that maximum speed and high speed do not solve the problem for, for, for trucks and, and for others as well. So, so I think there is a, is, is a big myth when it comes to speed that it's actually possible to drive at the maximum speed. It is sometimes, and that's when, when accidents happen. But I think it, you, if we had more facts on speed and transportation, demands, we wouldn't be so afraid of, of, of reducing speed. Because when we have really congestion or, or capacity problem, we reduce speed in, in, in order to increase capacity. Thank you, Lars. Uh, one thing I'd highlight as well, it's on our website, I'd love to be able to speak to you, but we don't have a lot of time, is uh, our, the SARSAI initiative actually did have a situation where they had an industrial zone with trucks uh, very near the school that Zoleka talks about in her film and it's on our site the the story of of, of how they addressed this uh with barriers um the, the trucks actually were crashing into the school um playground where the children were playing and sadly some children had died because of it um and it's a good example of low-cost intervention uh to um address that um i did see a a question um from a colleague uh in uh bahia in city of salvador um, asking about um, traffic educators in Brazil fighting for the Brazilian government uh, legislators to put traffic education in, in the student curriculum. And um, I know that, you know, we're talking about uh, Vision Zero and infrastructure interventions, which are the way to uh, prevent and address uh, road traffic fatalities. Alongside that, obviously, there is a place for, for education um, and also kind of engaging students and engaging the community. Uh, particularly through education. Would uh, anybody very quickly, I know it's a big subject, like to address 
where education fits into this. Uh, obviously, Vision Zero and Safe System being the priority, but how does education fit in? Lars, I thought you one might. One very short. I think education is essential for traffic planners and city planners. More and more important there, actually, than to train all the children, in my view. I think that is really what would be the real change. I mean, how come that we prioritize trucks before children? That, that is really something that needs to be changed. So traffic and societal planners need to be educated. I apologize, we have about one minute left and I want to address this question that's just come through, come through on disabilities. Uh, special consideration to take in schools for children with disabilities. I know we're really running out of time, but there might just be a few pointers that the panel can direct people to on disabilities. Um, do we have any answers? I know Natalie had covered sure. that. Thanks, Abby. I would, I would encourage you to please check out the UNICEF guidance. Um, I'll post that link too. There's a whole section on children with disabilities. Um, but the idea here is that if we make the journey to school safe for kids with disabilities, we'll make it safe for everybody. So that might look like um, curb ramps so that you can easily go up and down a curb on a wheelchair. If you've ever tried it, it's actually really hard. Um, so trying to mitigate that as best we can. Um, other just COVID techniques, right? If we're gonna encourage kids to take uh, public transport or a bus to school if they have a disability, um, sometimes masks with clear panels so they can lip read can be helpful. Um, but there's plenty of ways to make sure that our kids with disabilities can still get to school. And we have to do that now because those are the kids that will fall through the cracks um, during COVID if we don't. So I'll post that link. Thank you, Natalie. And I have to be very unpopular and end this and hand over to uh, Claudia to, to wrap up. But thank you all for a really engaging webinar. Claudia. And thank you very much, Abby, for a wonderful facilitation. Um, I think we have heard a lot today, very important messages from our panelists um, and from everyone that has participated. Um, I just want to finish this webinar, first of all, um, giving big thank you to Abby, uh, to Natalie, Amy, uh, Nani, Lars, uh, to our director, Annie Dascupta, for have joined us, and especially to all of you that are worried about what to do with children in uh, the cities. Please bear in mind that road safety is still the first cause of death for kids 5 to 14, and for young people and young adults 14 to 29 years old. This has to be different. We can accept this. We want, as Anita Skupta was saying, thriving in joyful cities, cities where we can see our kids using the space in a fair way, like everybody else. And as Soleka was saying, we do not need to go through the suffering of losing a child. This can be different. And Vision Zero provides an alternative to that. It tells us that because we make mistakes, because our kids make mistakes, they should not die or get seriously injured. We have heard from all our panelists how important it is to plan taking them into account. One of the main pieces in this conversation is speed, how difficult it is to think about lowering and managing speeds in our cities. That is crucial if we really are serious about protecting our kids. Now, once we think and we create a city that is good for kids, it's good for everyone. So let's go and work very hard to protect every single child in our communities. Thank you again. We will have a speed management webinar coming up on November 5th. So we look forward to having you there and thank you again for your time. Take care, bye-bye, thank you.